I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Um, with uh, John Harland leading our physics uh, study group, John is going to teach uh, me and all of us uh, how to do some calculations. Please, John. Okay. So last time, it kind of takes off from last time. I'm going to go ahead and stop my video here. So we were crashing through this last time. Um, so um, let me just remind you where we were. We started with a Gaussian wave packet in uh, this right here in, in position space. Um, we converted it to a Gaussian wave packet in momentum space. That's weird. Mm -hmm. Using the Fourier transform. Using this scale Fourier transform. And that gives you, um, you do that scale Fourier transform, you get another wave packet. And um, not surprising that, you know, the variance of that wave packet, the width of that wave packet is like a scaled one over the width of the of the original wave packet, as you would expect with the Fourier transform. And then we applied what we know about time evolution in momentum space, which is simple multiplication of this unimodular factor involving time. And then we did the inverse scaled Fourier transform, and we ended up with this new wave packet uh, which is a spreading wave packet dependent on time. So we start out with an initial wave packet and we end up with this processing through this whole machinery with a spreading wave packet. And, you know, the advantage of doing this in momentum space, going to momentum space, is that time evolution is really easy to explain in momentum space if the potential is zero. It's just multiplication by this magic factor right here. So... So we end up with this um, rather interesting looking expression here because it involves a variance that is complex. So hmm. our new wave packet is a complex value object. It's got some phase in it. Um, and not only that, we have to uh, make sense of what it makes, you know, what this factor is. It's our, our, our factor that depends on time. Um, and it's complex also. So to really understand this, I mean, we can look at the real and imaginary parts or what we could do is just look at the modulus of this. And I think that that's would be a better mm -hmm. computation. Like everything that I just but did you... hinges on this basic mathematical fact. And I think that, um, I think today I'd rather just explore this thing and try to interpret it. Sure. Um, and I think it, I think it'd just be more productive, and and we'll get some interesting physical results out of it, interpreting it. So we and so just to just to jump in, um, to catch up with my understanding, and so my understanding is that you have a position space uh, version of Schrodinger's equation, and in order to look at how the wave packet spread, you uh, took the Fourier transform, your particular version of the Fourier transform, uh, right. to a momentum space. Yes. where that evolution is quite straightforward because it's really just based on multiplication. Right, right. And then yeah. you're able to go back. So you get this formula. But like you're saying, the crucial thing is that um, the evolution was with regard to a, it introduced complex numbers. Yeah. So the new wave function in position space will be complex, but it's introduced through this sigma sub t, this uh, variance um, yeah, which uh, when you square it, it's got this complex, but it's appearing in two places. So that's one that you just showed in this um, normalization factor, but it's also appearing in the e. Is that right? Like the the e to the right. It appears in both places. So that's what I understood where we are. So yeah, I mean, so I mean, you know, so quantum mechanics. One of the difficulties is that it's you know the wave function is complex valued, so it's more complicated than just a real valued wave. That you might. Mm -hmm propagating through space you have to look at you have to look at the real and complex um parts of it to really fully understand it 
Um, much like you have to look at the electric field and the magnetic field to understand electromagnetic field. It's it's kind of a very analogous thing. Um, so um, everything I just did um, hinges on this basic fact, this basic mathematical fact right here. And um, so maybe in a later lecture, we can go over this basic mathematical fact and then actually, you know, work out the details of going from here to here and then here back to here using that fact. Um, mm -hmm. I think once you see one of these computations, you've seen them all. Um, mm -hmm. it, and, so, and that was based, you said, on the completing the square, right? Like based on completing the square, yeah. So, I mean, there's a yeah, little, so we'll little, little, do that in the little future, bit of technical yeah. stuff there. And there, then there's also this, this kind of interesting integral here, which is a complex value integral. And and we'll use a contour integral to simplify this. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's that. So there are some mathematical details here. I don't want to say they're trivial, but they are just a matter of working out the computations and and there therefore there's not a lot of physics to learn from them but it's it is it is interesting math in its own right and it's seminal math in the sense that um this formula whether people know it or not they use it all the time in mathematics it's like a i don't know why i've never seen it isolated like this before but it's a real useful formula um and uh so anyway let's 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 try to understand this now, one way to understand a, um, a complex value thing is that you can do it in terms of real and imaginary parts, but I think it's more productive um, writing this in terms of its modulus and an e to the i theta t factor. Mm-hmm. Okay, so in other words, in polar form, and in particular, I'm not even going to look at this thing right here, although it might be interesting. I, I haven't necessarily done that, um, but we are going to look at this one right here. In other words, the modulus. So we'll understand mm -hmm. at least some aspect of this wave function by looking at its modulus. And, but in fact, we're not going to... Should the modulus equal one if it's a probability density? Or not? No, no. Um, what we're going to do is, instead of looking at the modulus, we're going to look at the modulus squared. Oh, okay. And no, that's not equal to one, but its integral is equal to one. It better be. And so we're going to... Okay, verify. okay. So... DT, is that right? Or, no, DX. Yeah, D, 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 no, DX. That's right, DX. Thank you. So at each time, that gives us a probability density function of X. So okay. that's really what we're after here. We want to understand that probability density function. And and uh, what do you do to understand a probability density function? You just simply take the modulus. You you do, what is what is this? It's just, uh, what does it mean? It means you take, just the the you just take the um quantity times this complex conjugate and so you're thinking okay quantity times this complex conjugate so um let's just go ahead and do that um and so what's that going to give us um well let me just say in general if you've got something that looks like this if you have you know a quantity that looks like a a complex number times e to the complex number and you want to know what is the mo what is the modulus squared of that well you could just take the modulus squared of this and the modulus squared of the second thing now the modulus mm -hmm. squared of the second thing is going to be e to the b uh times e to the b complex conjugate but e to the b complex conjugate 
is just e to the b times e to the b complex conjugate. So you have to verify that. I mean, you can think of it in terms of Taylor series because this has a mm -hmm. Taylor series with real, uh, with all real coefficients. You can, you can, uh, the complex conjugate goes into the inside of the Taylor series and affects only the argument and not, mm -hmm. not the overall thing. So, I mean, we can verify that if you want to. Well, what is this? This is e to the two real b, real part of b. And another another way I would think about that is just to say like e to the i theta, you know, where where it's imaginary, um, that's going to be just one. Right, because the real part is zero. And right, you know, so example, it's, e it's only the, the real part that can be yeah. A non so you have know, like e to the five plus i, you know, plus six. 6i, and we want to know what its modulus is. It's going to be, it's just going to be e to the 5 times e to the 6i. Right. And then that's going to be e to the 5, I'm sorry, squared, times e to the 6i squared. Well, e to the 6i just has modulus 1, so it's going to be e to the 10, which is e to the 2 real part of, of mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so... Um, going a couple pages here. 10 page. Okay. Um, so that means that this squared is just equal to this part okay so we need to take the square of this thing so we need to take the absolute value because we have a one half it's gonna it's gonna cancel with the two here so we need to take the absolute value of this The modulus of that and then it's going to be e to the minus two the real part of this mess here that should be a square there that's weird i didn't put a square i did i just didn't copy okay so and let me remind you um sigma sub t squared is equal to the original sigma squared, sigma, sigma not squared that we started out with the initial wave packet, plus uh, it's got the complex part here, i h bar t over 2m. All right. So Let's just work out each one of these independently. Um, this first part right here, we'll just chew on that for a bit. That's gonna be, well, sigma naught is just a positive constant. And we have two pi, and then we just have to take the modulus of sigma t squared. This way modulus is a multiplicative homomorphism. So um, we can apply modulus to any one of these factors that we want. Two of them are positive real numbers. We pull them out. So we got this. And then the modulus of this thing right here Everything's real except for the eye. That's right. Modules of that. And forgive me for a moment. I just want to make sure that all the units work out, and I think it does. Yeah. Okay. When t is equal to zero. Was it the modulus yeah. squared or not? Oh, no, no, you already did that. You already yeah. did that. Okay. Yeah. You already these did two, that. Yeah, these two cancel each other yeah so 
And we just have to be careful about our algebra. It's just, you know, how do you take the modulus of a, oh, interesting, of, of, a, of a real, let's see, what's the modulus of a real number plus an imaginary number? That's equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared, just the Pythagorean theorem. And mm -hmm. so uh, we'll take this, this sigma naught over 2 pi times 1 over sigma naught to the fourth power plus h squared t squared over 4m squared to the 1 half power. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Probably we can make this yeah, interesting. And right now, like, so if T is zero, then um, then it would be the s sigma zero to the fourth. A square root would be sigma zero squared. And then you'd get one over two pi sigma zero. Is that right? Right. Um... I'm sorry, I, I I was distracted by something else, but I think, um, I don't want to try to, uh, I'm sorry, what was your, what was your question again? I was just thinking like if, you know, if what cancels, what simplifies, but if T equals zero, T equals then zero. you'd get one over square root of sigma zero to the fourth, that'd be one over sigma zero squared on the bottom. Uh, it, you get to cancel with the sigma naught on top you get one over two pi sigma zero. Yes. Which gives me a little bit of pause. Right. Um, you're right. And so what I'm what I'm worried about right now is, oh, our square root. I dropped my square root. Okay. Yeah. So that that's right. So, yeah, so a check on this would be, like you say, it's a good to check things as you're going along. When t is equal to zero, you get this is equal to one over square root of two pi sigma zero, which is what we need for, you know, when this thing starts out, this whole thing starts out when sigma, when t is equal to zero, this whole thing starts out being the initial Gaussian wave packet. Mm-hmm. And the initial Gaussian wave packet had that multiplicative factor, this in front of it, the at least mm -hmm. when, when you took the modulus squared of it. So that is good indeed. Okay. So, but what I want to do is I want to write this. We're just going to be a little bit maybe clever here is you want this to be to look like this one over the square root of two pi times, and I'm going to call this. I need some notation for it. I guess I'm just going to call it sigma t. Uh, better not call it sigma t because I've already used that. Yeah, I hope not. Yeah, we're already yeah, using. Let's it. not use that. Okay. So again, I'm sort of fumbling around here. So let's call it. How about capitals? Is that okay to call it like that? What's a better? I, I want something <laughs> of t. I want, and I, I want it to act like it's a six. How about v? V is the variance. Variance, if you like, variance. But that looks like little velocity. v. That little v looks like velocity. I mean, we're running out of. We're, you know, um, if you'll just indulge me, I'm going to call this sigma sub t. That's so, fine. Okay. I indulge you. Capital sigma. Okay. So what does capital sigma have to be equal to? Uh, it has to be equal to to this mess. Can I just share a thought I have? Is it? It's interesting. Yeah, please. This please. whole factor t squared over uh, times h bar squared over four m squared, and it just suggests that like the units for time that are kind of natural in this context would be like T equals 2M over H bar. That it's like, kind of like mass over H bar. Um, that Like if you wanted to get that to be one or two or three or four, like integers, that's kind of curious. 
what mass over h bar would mean, but uh, yeah, h bar, yeah. Hmm. Well, sigma has units of space of distance. Sigma sigma naught has units of distance. Um, so anyway, let um, let's keep on barreling through here. I'm going to bring this sigma up inside there. I'm going to. I'm going to bring it inside the square root. So it becomes a square. So this becomes sigma squared plus, um, and I'm sorry, do I want that to be sigma squared? Oh, strange. No, I don't. Um, and then plus h bar squared t squared over 4m squared sigma not squared to the 1 half power. So you can see that when t is equal to zero, this is just equal to sigma naught, which is what you want. So this is essentially going to be the variance um, of our, or the square root of the variance of our, of our new distribution, uh, our new density function. So we'll see that in a moment. Okay. All right. So. Uh, just a question. So what's the difference between sigma sub t and big sigma sub t? Uh, because sigma sub t, uh, big sigma sub t is actually going to be the variance of our new probability density over space. Okay. Our and what was the old variance, sigma t? Old, the old, little sigma t? Yeah, what was our old, yeah, our old variance was that. But our new sigma sub t, as we're going to find out in a moment, um, is going to be our old sigma sub t augmented by time in this way so you can see that it's spreading out linearly in time but what what was the sigma sub t that we we're using before what was that can you show that that was our complex sigma our complex sigma was uh this right here that's our complex sigma and okay. and so and this will be a real sigma or not? Uh, no, this will not be a real. Yeah, so it's kind of it. You know, our com our complex sigma. It's funny. It's it doesn't quite. Uh, you know, the modulus of this complex quantity is not quite. The modulus is not quite this. You know, at least the square root of the modulus. In other words, um, yeah, we get we get something that looks like, like if you looked at the modulus of this thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so this one, just for me, it doesn't have a square root. It's just sum. But the other one has a square root. Let me just check this. Let's take the modulus of this thing. This is equal to sigma naught to the fourth power plus h bar squared t squared over 4m squared all to the 1 half power. So notice that that differs from our our big sigma sub t. Just barely because of the sigma naught in the squared in the bottom. Is that right? Yeah, no. Is that it's, the difference? Yeah, because we have a sigma naught square. We we have the sigma naught in the bottom. So it things are a little bit things are a little bit uh, weird because we're talking about you know it doesn't quite work out that this is okay. Active. So it's a uh, it's sigma naught times uh, sigma. So big sigma sub t equals sigma naught times the ver the the absolute of uh, sigma little sigma sub t. Yes. Yeah, so Is that correct? Let's write this. I think you're right. Okay. So little little sigma sub t is a complex quantity, but if we take its modulus and divide by sigma naught, that's a weird thing. Hmm. I'm a little bit well, or the way to or, or the way to look at it is to multiply out, like so. Sigma naught times big sigma t equals the sigma sub t, right? It's a multiplicative factor. That's what the yeah. big sigma t is. Right. So this isn't quite the variance that we want. I mean, this is the variance that that is actually going to be the variance of our probability distribution. Um, I'm okay. I'm just slightly 
like uh, the units don't seem to be working out. Um, oh, sorry. No, things are a little bit different. Sorry, this is squared. Yeah, things are really different. Yeah, I'm sorry. This okay, is... so you put the square, you need to put the square in there. Right. So I'm sorry. Wait, 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 wait. If you That's go back, the oh, because it's the absolute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like if you take the if you take the modulus of this quantity with the square in it, then you get this. You have to get this squared plus this squared to the one half power. So yeah, I was missing a I was missing a square there. So it it is, you know, I mean, it is a little bit weird that we have to take the complex variance, take its modulus squared, divide by the initial variance to get the actual variance of the of the of the probability distribution. I mean another way to look at it would be to multiply those two together, right? The big sigma t times the sigma naught equals the Okay. Yeah. But it turns out that this is going to have relevance for the actual probability distribution. Okay. Whereas This does not. This is not, okay. you know. So it's a little, it, it's just, it's the same, you know, it's the same reason that, you know, we get a sigma naught here and not just a two pi sigma t squared here. I was confused mm -hmm. about that, believe me, when I was doing my notes to begin with, uh, when I went through this, I was just, that that threw me off. That I, I spent, I spent hours trying to sort through that, like what's going on here. Then I realized mm -hmm. that, no, this is not the variance. It's not that's a complex variance, but you know mm -hmm. to get to get back to get back to actual variance, you need this factor here. So everything mm -hmm. sort of everything is a little bit more complicated than you wish it was. You wish it was just this this variance, but it's not. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's that's the cost of doing business with complex numbers. Okay, so let's continue here. So what were we after? We were trying to find the modulus of this. And we found that. Sorry. We found that. Um, but that's now, the big sigma t. That's the big sigma sub t, right? That's our big. Yeah. Well, that's our um, 1 over 2 pi. So this part here. Oh, sigma naught over square yeah, root of 2 pi? Yeah. We're writing this as 1 over 2 pi square root of 2 pi sigma sub t. And the reason okay. we're, do, we're doing that is because a Gaussian, you know, a, a Gaussian, again, is of the form, you know, e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared 1 over the square root of 2 pi sigma. That's a Gaussian probability distribution mm -hmm. with variance. I see. Yeah. So the big sigma t is playing this role. I see. Yeah, with varying sigma. sigma. Yeah, with with varying sigma. sigma. Yeah. Okay. So big sigma t is playing this role here. Okay. So we got that part worked out. Let's work out this part. So e to the minus two real parts of x squared over four sigma t squared. Okay, so first of all, let's figure out what x squared, well, basically we have to figure out, this is gonna be um, equal to e to the, now why did I put a two there? Did I really want that? Yeah, I did, two real parts. So I want, this is gonna be, uh, what is it gonna be? X squared over two times the real part, um, one over sigma t squared. So what is the real part? Of one over sigma t squared. So the real part, um, that's gonna be the real part of one over sigma naught squared plus i h bar t over two m. Is that right? 
Okay, it is. And how do you find the real part of such a such an object? Well, you multiply by this complex conjugate, so it's mm -hmm. going to be the real part. Let's go ahead and just write that. Let's isolate that. The real part of the real part of one over a plus b times i is equal to you multiply by the complex conjugate so it's going to be the real part of a minus b i over a plus b i modulus squared because i is are you okay with that computation you just multiply yeah it. and then it'll be uh, a over a squared plus b squared that's right all right You got it. Okay. So it's going to be A over A squared plus B squared. You got to square the. A better, yeah. No, my mind was already somewhere else. Yeah, I think I did that right. Okay, uh, let's see. How is that related to this thing here? Oh, where did my T go? My T is there. Okay. And this is equal to... one over... Sigma t squared, I believe. Mm -hmm. Is it? If that's sigma t, big sigma t, yeah. You square it, that goes away, that becomes a square. Yeah. Good. Good. That's exactly what we wanted, right? Mm -hmm. So, summary. Let's just summarize everything we just found here. Uh, this probability distribution is of this form. It's 1 over 2 pi sigma t e to the minus x squared over 2 times the real part of that, which we decided is 1 over sigma t squared. x squared over 2 sigma t squared. And this is a Gaussian. And the sigma t is real. That's a... Yeah, it's now real. Gaussian probability distribution. Mm. And then that takes care yeah. of the fact that this Darian. integral will be one when yep. you integrate over that's x right. we don't... That's right. negative infinity to infinity. Exactly. So I'll accept that. Good. Oh, and so it's very interesting. So it has the exact same form as before. You just replace sigma naught with uh, big sigma sub t. Right. Is that right? In fact, like big sigma sub t will equal big sigma, will equal to sigma sub naught when t equals zero. Is that correct? Or that's, I suppose. Let's, let's hope so. Oh, this is one over. Oh, I'm sorry. One would hope so. And it will, you know, when you set, when you get rid okay, of that. Okay, that's you, clear, yeah. right. So, yeah, yeah. So, let's let's go ahead and make a little And graph. then if, if, you, if you look at my thing again, so T is having units of M, of 2M over H bar times sigma naught, let's say, right? So, and those would be, uh, you're saying sigma naught is going to have units of distance, right? So it's converting time to distance in the H bar as units of energy, I think, right? So. Yeah, this has units that, well, sigma t squared has units of distance squared, yeah. So uh, I just wanna make sure, oh, wait a minute. What, what happened to my, oh, I, I squared everything. Yeah, good, 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 good. Very squared, yeah. Okay. 
So during so then, it starts out being sigma naught. This is if you if you uh, graph this, you're going to end up you know starting here. It's going to be quadratic, and so it's going to go up over time. And that's the variance squared. And then the is that right? Yeah. So, and then the variance the variance, squared, so like the variance is going linear, like you said. It before. is. It goes linearly with time. That's right. And that was your so that was and the fact, upshot of all your calculation. You thought it might be going exponentially. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But actually it's going yeah. linearly. I know, I know. I know. I was wrong. I was wrong. Well, you were wrong, but you were smart enough to figure out like, <laughs> oh, you made a discovery. I better, I, yeah, I figure I better ver I better verify that. And, you know, it's because everything was in an exponential and I just, you know, just looked at that and I thought, oh, wow. You know, mm -hmm. when she increases, my goodness, this, uh, you know, this is in increasing quite fast. So everything is dying down exponentially fast. No, it's not. It's linearly fast. And so yes, when you let's go ahead, let's let's go ahead and just compute this. Um, this is going to be well, and so so it's from a dimensional point of view, it's comparable to, um, I guess, velocity of a particle. Like there's the velocity of the particle, but then there's the spread of the particle or wave packet or whatever, and that they're both in the same units. That's what this is saying. Is that right, or am I wrong? Um, it's linear in time. It's linear in time. And let me just write it out. Um, you know, it, it, let's just factor it out just to make it absolutely clear what's happening with the time variation. Mm -hmm. Um, I haven't done but this before, mm -hmm. but I think this is productive to do. Um, let's yeah. write it like that. Let's factor it, all the good stuff out. Uh, yes, let's factor all the good stuff out. And uh, that means I got the denominator factor out. So this becomes one plus uh, sigma to the fourth. That's four M squared over H bar squared T squared. I think that's. And so this part goes to zero. Wait, wait, wait. That seems. Can we just double check that? Because you've, you've. I'm going to factor out this and this. But then, why are you left with one? Inside. Well, if you factor out a. Oh, square and I took the square root. I took the square root. I took the square root of this, and I factored out this divided by this i just don't maybe i have to catch up with you i don't see if you if you factored out like i can see how you get one if you only divide through okay when you divide through by by sigma naught squared you're going to get one right let's let's just do this let's do this okay it's going to be the square root i might be wrong you know um this is going to be let's divide this into two terms here um, it's going to be sigma naught squared plus yes. h bar squared mm -hmm. t squared over 4m squared sigma naught squared. I just want to factor this whole thing out. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, you want to figure that? Oh, I see. And then the terms flip around. I see. That's what you did. I uh, The left yeah. and the right change. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm missing. Yeah. And, you know, when I try to do these two things too fast, I often make mistakes. Well, don't then put the one on the uh, put the one on the right just for people one like me who because right. you, so you switch them. You switch this a Monty yes. Monty. <laughs> indeed. indeed. And so it's going to be um, I just want to make sure. OK, so <laughs> now I'm having a hard time myself. Um, uh, I better have a sigma. I have, to, I have to multiply by the reciprocal, so I'm going to have a 4m squared sigma naught to the fourth power over h bar squared t squared plus 1. 
Yeah, that's for simpletons like me. That's more more clear. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. This stuff is going to zero. When is it going to zero? When T goes. Oh, as T grows big, I see. So this whole thing goes to looks more and more like H bar T over two M for large G. We could oh, do the so you get behavior. You have the behavior when t equals zero, and you have the behavior when t is. Uh, so t that's is right. That's right. So t, yeah. So, so this variance, how fast it's increasing, it goes toward h bar over two m sigma naught. Hmm. Uh, for large t. I mean, do we believe that? I mean, we have to apply the, you know, the product rule and chain rule and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but you know, the, and so and so that's a velocity, like because it's a distance with regard right. to time. That's right. That's right. So it's a velocity. So is that what I got? I just want to make sure that's what I got. And and. Uh... Oh, and where'd my pie go? Where's all my pies? Wait, two pies. That's just the sigma t. That's sigma t. That's sigma t. Yes. Uh, yeah, right. Sigma t. Okay, and then yeah, just a, just a dimensional check. Like h bar is a quantum unit of uh, energy. Yeah. And so h bar over m, if h if h bar is like one half mv squared, so then it'll be like velocity squared will be h bar over m. And then sigma naught is uh, also no, that's just a distance. So, hmm. So I think the graph looks like this. It 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 starts out slowly, but then it goes. It it veers up toward a linear graph. I'm just thinking of a dimensional check. H bar over M would be velocity squared, right? But then velocity squared divided by sigma naught is position, you said. Or no, it's position squ squared. It's position squared. See, it's got a it's got a okay. Cancel. So then but then velocity squared over position squared would be time squared. Um well, let's think about it. But this is sigma t squared, or is this sigma t? Let's go down back. You know, so I might. I think that's that's a squared. Okay, yeah. Let's just check that. The so this should, this is position squared, right? Are you are you checking this one here, or what? Which one? I was are you checking, checking the final one where you said d d sigma t over. But we can check any of them. But uh... so that'd be velocity. This would be velocity. Okay, so, but how do we get velocity if h bar over m is velocity squared divided by distance? No, wait a minute. H bar is h bar is angular momentum, right? So it's it's oh it, okay. It's, it, it's equal to velocity. Oh, it's not. I got it wrong. It's not energy. It's angular x momentum. You're right. Times it's velocity times x times mass. Right, so the mass cancels, and the x cancels here, so we end up with velocity. Very good. Okay, okay. I'm glad you corrected me. No, no, it's good that you did that. So anyway, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not drawing this very nicely here, but if you, I think what happens is this thing lurches upward. It starts out that the, that the wave package just kind of hangs there for a bit, and then it starts spreading out, and then over time, it, it, kind of. It gets flatter and flatter. With slope h bar. But, over but if I'm just thinking of its square root of those two terms, right? 
and the first term is getting the first term is still non-zero when its t is small, right? Yeah, it starts out rather sluggish. Uh, well, no, but that's going to go to zero, so it's going to be less uh, relevant. Uh, it seems like it's uh, it should at least be giving a little bit of kick in the beginning. Oh, it's not it? reducing. It's uh, yeah. So let's think about just that. That initial kick is not going to be. Uh, no, you remember it's it's competing with that. Um, it's competing with what? No, but they're not competing. Uh, if you if 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 that second term was not a square root, it was just one, right? Okay, wait. Are you talking about here? No, uh, the line below sigma capital big 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 sigma sub t. The line below, right? Yeah. You have the yeah. factor of t, right? And then you have a square root, right? Yeah. I'm talking about like whether your graph makes sense when t is close to zero right then then um the two the two summons are not uh they're both contributing something but the point is this well this is this is when very the square point. root my, my point is this is like when the when you go to t infinity right like the whole square root becomes irrelevant right yes okay but when you haven't gone to infinity and you're closer to zero well it's going to be greater than one. Uh, well, yes, but yeah, uh, don't look at don't look at this. Don't look at this. Look at this. I mean that. You know, remember I factored out a t. So uh, this. No, but I'm looking at the velocity. I'm looking at the slope. So, in okay. the end, you're going to have a line, right? In the end, you're going to have a line, right? Right. But the question is, how do you approach that line? No, from below or from above? I think it's from above. Or you think you think you initially come out fast and go like that? I don't think. Well, so. I think that's what it's showing because look at what you well, have. Let's do let's do a simpler example. But no, first... no, 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 no. But just I'm just just follow me through. Yeah. Look 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 at the equation you have and sh let me just explain. Take right here, right here. Look. This one. When t goes to infinity, the whole don't look at that. Look at the one below. Yeah. When t goes to infinity, you're going to get square root of one, right? That'll just yes. be one. Is that correct? Okay, yes. then you'll just have your line, right? Yes, yes. Now, when t is close to zero, right, that square root is going to be greater than one. Oh, it's going to go toward infinity. Yeah, the square root, I mean, it's going to get very, very large. Well, no, because uh, it's going to uh, cancel across, you know, you got a t divided by t squared. Yes. They'll can't they'll cancel, but uh, well, yeah, I think the healthier way of looking at for small t is to look at this one, not not the one below it. I, I think I think. It, well, the point the point was like the one below it has, it has a complicated t dependence because it's got a t out here and a t here. Yeah, but the point is is that the slope will increase. Well, let's, it's giving let's, you this. Can, can we okay. look at a simple example? You explain it your way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can we look at a simple example? Let's let's look at let, let's look at this. Um, we have, let's look at a, uh, a function that looks like this. Let's call it S. F of S is equal to some number plus B times S squared. All right. Okay. So that's what we got. That's the functional form we have, right? Um, where A and B are positive, right? A and B, yeah. A and B are greater than zero. Yeah. Better B. And um, so let's take a look at its derivative. It's going to be uh, it's going to be b times s over the square root of uh, a plus b s squared, right? Chain rule. Okay. Okay. And this wait, is wait, wait, wait. Where's the? It's square to one half. It should be. Oh, yeah, it's the, one over the one, the one half canceled with the two coming down from the power rule there. Okay. Okay. You can tell I've recently taught calculus. Okay. And you can tell I haven't recently studied calculus. Okay. You let's win. Take a look at what, uh, let's take a look at what this. Okay. So this starts out when s is equal to zero, it starts out being zero, right? Right. And um and it and so what is the s dependence here so so that justifies the graph here being having a slope of zero to begin with 
In other words, I see. Yeah. And then um and then it's always positive. So this is it starts out the graph is is you know flat here, but there's positive. And then if you look at in the second derivative, I believe that we're gonna find the second derivative is always positive. So it's concave up. I mean, do you want to do that? Well, or if it starts out flat, if it starts out flat and then, then it's going to be uh and b is a yeah b is positive, then it's going to it, it, there's not any other way it could do it. Right, right. Well, yeah, I mean it could it could maybe go like this, you know, I don't know. <laughs> but probably not. Um, so uh, but I think you can easily do a second derivative calculation, see that everything's got to be positive all the time. Um and uh so do you, well, do you, why don't we just do the second derivative just to kind of, you know, just to kind of kill it? Let's kill it. Bottom times the derivative of the top. Minus top times the derivative of the bottom. Over bottom squared. Okay, now this is always positive. And what we need to, what we want to show is that the top is always positive also. So the top is going to be, so um, I want to multiply through by the square root of a plus b f squared. That's not going to affect the positivity of the top. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a plus b f squared times b minus s times bs okay so that will be a times b is that what you this is going to be no there's a b squared i'm sorry okay so i'm sorry it'll be a me... a b plus i want to make sure i did this computation correctly um b s squared so this is going to be a b plus b squared f squared minus b times f squared. Now this seems to be dependent on, so I think I made a mistake. Uh, this is b squared minus b times s squared. Everything would be fine if b squared minus b was positive, but it, maybe it's not. So let's see. Uh, did I make a mistake? Bottom times derivative of the top minus top. Oh, bs times the derivative of the bottom. Ah, there's an extra b here. Okay, and then those cancel out. So you get a b. A b, which is greater than zero. Boom. Okay, so you you proved your point. I'm glad we did that. So then. Okay, so like physically, let's interpret that now, right? Like what you're... So let's just, let's tabulate this. So it's going to be F versus S starts out, slope is zero, concave up, and increasing. And uh, in our case, we know that it eventually has to be linear. So I think that, yeah, I think that, I think this was the correct... But it's good. It's good That's to question. I, you know, I think. Um, and so this is a, so now in terms of the variance, it's saying like you're saying in the beginning, like for a short amount of time, there's not any change or that's very negligible change in the beginning. And I don't know about you, but half the time when I'm doing like research type stuff, I'm correcting my my mistakes half the time. Sure. Uh, it might be 30% of the time, it might be 55% of the time, but it's somewhere in there. It's like a, a large part of it is checking yourself and correcting. And and yeah. now you're trying to prove that nature does that by with this culling factor of two. I am. I am. Yeah, That's I'd right. Like that to... Nature makes the same mistakes you do. Right. That's what, right. That's what we're trying to well, prove. Because, yeah, because nature has these inconsistent minds about the way reality should be. Um. 
Okay, so can we physically or you physically? Oh, yeah, so let's do that. Yeah, so let's, I mean, this, this is rather fascinating. So it says for large T. So, so anyway, I just want to. So that means that the, the velocity. So the spreading, the wave packet spread, velocity of spread. Let's call that velocity of spread um, is equal to well, it's approximately equal to zero when t is small, and it goes to our magic number h bar over two m sigma naught. when t is, uh, grows. So the max velocity of spread is, um, well, it's, it's approaching 2m sigma naught, okay. So let's say that sigma naught hydrogen. Sigma naught is approximately equal to about 10 to the minus 10 meters on angstrom. What's the mass of an electron? About 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Is that right? Let's see, I've got this written down. No self-respecting physicist would not know this. Yes, I have no respect. <laughs> That's a problem right. with me. But maybe I'm not, not a physicist. Know mass, not know the mass of an electron. Um, ridiculous. Mass of electron is M. Mass of electron. Uh, I have it written down. Where are you? You're written down somewhere. Am I going to have to look this up in the book? 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. That's what I wrote. I guess yeah, I'm self-respecting. That's what I get to. And what is H? And what is H is, oh gosh, 6.67 times, what are you, H, times 10 to the minus 6.63. Can I send the minus 24? I don't believe that. 10 to the minus 34. 34. 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34? Yeah. Meters yeah. squared kilograms per second. Right. And therefore, let's call this Vmax max velocity of spread. So V max in this case is going to be when you work all this out, I mean you can put this in a calculator you want, or you can just trust me. I get five point about six times 10 to the fifth meters per second, which is equal to about uh one over two hundred ten to the speed of light. Hmm. Do I believe that? Mm. I'm not so sure. Well, Do I believe that? Ten to the eighth. How many is it? Ten to the eighth meters per second, or is it? So I'm sorry. This might be. Yeah, about six times ten to the yeah. So if we multiply by a factor of a thousand. Well, but it's it's three times ten to the eighth. Is that correct? It's three times ten to the Meters eighth. It's not one over two hundred. I'm sorry. It's one over two thousandths. No, it's one over five hundred. You multiply by a thousand, you get six times ten to the eighth. Half of that is three times ten to the eighth. 
So it's one over 500 is the speed of light. That's weird. How did I get one over 200? I'm wondering if I made a mistake here. Why would I write one over 200? Where did I write that? Well, whatever. Well, and then you have H bar, so that would be. Uh... Yeah, no, I think. You need to divide by 2 pi? No, I think I already have. Funny, yeah. I just I I tricked myself before to thinking that was one over two hundred. We take the speed of light, which is three hundred times ten to the seven. <clears throat> no, I'm sorry, thirty times ten to the seven meters per second. We divide by five hundred. We get five times ten to the fifth meters per second, which is what we have here. No, we have six times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So, yeah, I think I think I was just. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, yeah, OK. So that's not very relativistic, right? It's not super relativistic, but it's let, let's go ahead and, and look at the uncertainty principle. I just want to verify this um, because. OK. Um, and then I think I've got to go. Um, mm -hmm. Page. Okay, so the uncertainty principle. The minimum uncertainty, which holds for Gaussian wave packets, is delta x delta p. is greater than or equal, well, is equal to, at minimum, uncertainty h bar over two. And so delta p is m delta v. So that means delta v is equal to h bar over two m times delta x. And isn't that what we got up here? Yes. It's exactly the same thing. H bar over 2m times, well, delta x is the is the variance, um, square root of the variance. So h bar over 2m as before. So what's interesting is that out of this, you know, it's pr probably not that surprising that out of this whole formalism, you get the minimum of the uncertainty principle for the spreading of the, of the wave function. Um, isn't it interesting that in the beginning, though, right in the beginning, the velocity is about zero, right? Mm-hmm. Isn't that and so what I was wondering, that, I was wondering what, like, but how could the velocity be zero, the spreading of the wave packet? Well, and the spreading of the wave packet isn't quite the velocity, it's, it's the average, you know, it's sort of the average velocity, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a measure of the average velocity of how fast the thing spreads. And so it's not quite, see, we're interpreting this probabilistically. So I think that it's, it's you know, to say that the velocity is zero in the beginning is, is, is a misnomer. It's saying that the wave packet, this kind of random walk that this thing is doing, is, you know, it's, con it's confined originally to within an angstrom. But there's still some velocity in there. And even though that velo you know, even though that thing isn't spreading out that fast at the beginning, doesn't mean that there's not uncertainty in velocity. It just takes a while for it to catch up. Like it's a ran like the thing if something was 
you were if you you're were saying that the variants could be going smaller well i don't know if the variants could be going smaller um i guess it could be if you revert i mean this whole thing could be reverse in time right um yeah i mean that uh if you start out with the right initial condition the variance could be shrinking yes so and in the beginning there's an average where it's just not clear if it's getting smaller or larger but in the end it becomes clear that it is growing larger overall right and and I think one thing physically interesting to calculate with your curve is to find the place where, well, let's say it's halfway between zero and the um, and the ultimate uh, velocity, right? Like, what's the distance at which they balance over here? Right? Where you get like half the velocity? Huh. That'd be an interesting thing to calculate, you know, like, and how much bigger is that than the original packet? Like, you know, what's the size at which, uh, at which the other one, you know, that, that'd be like the midpoint in terms of the effect. Which effect are you? That's a probably an easy calculation. And we might be, you know, these, these things really mean maybe something a little bit different. Um, those two things right there. Uh, in other words, one is if you're measuring position, how much uncertainty is there in velocity? The other is how fast exactly is the wave packet spreading out? And they just happen to be coincidentally, you know, and you could probably argue from the point of view of random walks, why for large amounts of time, you know, over large amounts of time, these two things would give you the same thing. You know, in other words, I don't want to, you know, we might be conflating things a little bit here. And it's just sort of, a, it's sort of amazing that you get the same prediction out of the, out of the uncertainty principle as the exact computation out of Schrodinger. Mm -hmm. But I'm starting to think that they're saying slight, something slightly different. And then there's probably some argument for why over large time you would see the wave packet spreading out according to the uncertainty and velocity. Um, that'd be a different contemplation but i'm the fact that this is only the ultimate velocity the long the large t velocity of the spreading out of the wave packet the second thing and the first thing is the actual uncertainty you have in velocity the fact that the match up is maybe a little bit of a discussion you know it's not mm -hmm. entirely clear why they should be the same but it, it's it is very interesting that they are. Um, Great. Right. Any any final words on all these calculations? No, yeah, I and think then that's we'll... it. That's what I wanted to do. I mean, it, it. You know, I mean, all these things, even though they're they're not not particularly difficult computations, they all take time. You know, and they're, it's easy to make mistakes on all of them. And so it's well, good. and they're they would be daunting for you know, it's so much more inviting like to have you to walk with you through these woods than to enter by myself. I think I just avoid them. So, um, uh, and then I hope we'll have another session on the other calculation, you know, which yeah. would even ground it even more. Like, how did you arrive at these formulas, you know, using the Fourier transform and making that integral, right? Like, yeah. that's something that I'd like to see. Um, just as just an aside, but, and I could maybe even do this myself, maybe I would present it, but, uh, just to try to do that calculation to see the halfway point, um, where yeah. does where do you get half the velocity, right? Like, because that would give a kind of size factor, hmm. right? Like, uh, right. At, at what point, and a time factor, you know, like like how much time goes by, what's the size in in which you have uh, that change in behavior. And so then I just want to thank you for uh, taking me on your uh, journey of research uh, and uh, letting me learn from you and to be able to connect with you. I look forward to your visiting me in Lithuania and I'll be preparing this. Uh, and so we'll have more, more of your talks. And then um, there's people out there, somebody who may see what you're working on, you know, what I'm working on and might want to engage us and so that would be so my my prayer is that let this just keep going thank you uh yeah and let me just let me just mention one last thing here mm -hmm. i just want to say that one one five hundred the speed of light is nothing nothing to dismiss um mm -hmm. because, uh i believe that the one over 300 137 fine structure constant can be explained using the dirac equation 
um, there's a hyperfine structure constant that you need for, I think that's, you know, relative, you know, it's, that, that's quantum field theory, I think. But the, but there is this uh, differing in the energy levels from experiment to, from Schrodinger to experimentation, or something like a factor of one over 300, 137. So one over 137. Mm -hmm. I think so, something like that. And so that is a relativistic effect. So one over 500 of the speed of light, you are starting to see a little bit of relativity creeping in here. It's only, it's only by a fraction of a percent, but it is enough for, it was enough for experimentalists to pick up early on. So not trivial. Not dismissible. Not, not negligible. I mean, not, not negligible. completely negligible. Yeah, yeah. It, it enters into the picture. Yeah. But not dominant, like in the sense that it's not, uh, it's of a different order. Right. But if you, but if you can find, and I mean, we could do those, comp, you know, with that simple formula, I think that you can convince yourself if you can find a particle of, as massive as an electron, I mean, with <clears throat> this, <laughs> With the same mass of the electron, if you could find an electron to ten to the minus fifteenth, I believe you know you now start getting the spreading of a wave packet that is that is nearly the speed of light. You know, so oh, when you get like to the size of a proton, or or yeah, just you know something something you know much much smaller than a than, a, than an atom. You know, orders of magnitude smaller than an atom. So that's an indication that there's something wrong with with the Schrodinger picture. That you know these small confinements can lead to faster than the speed of light. Well, and if, if you go even smaller, then you'll be breaking the speed of light right. in terms of the uh, in terms of the spreading of the packet. But is that a problem? It's not a problem in the Dirac formalism, but it is a problem in the Schrodinger formalism. The Schrodinger but, form but is that a problem? Like for, is there a problem if the wave packet goes uh, spreads faster than the speed of light? If there is, because then you can make a squawker. You can make a, you can make a quantum squawker that would communicate with something distant, faster than the speed of light. Right. All you got to do is make these particles, confine these particles uh, to something like ten to the minus fifteenth or smaller, and just let them go. And some of them will be picked up in a distant place faster than the speed of light, and you'll be able to communicate. So, oh, I see. Like you're going to have like a thousand particles, and you're going to force them all to be tight, and then somebody's going to get out. But, but you can't control the direction. Uh, you probably can. I mean, the experimentalists are very, very clever about how they control all kinds of stuff. Oh, they can control so that it could actually, and, but, it could actually but if you be. Can't control direction. Things. It still means that that. Um, you know, with a series of detectors out there far enough, you know, and enough of them that someone's going to get something faster than the speed of light and be able to then send a message back into your past by the same, by the same mechanism. You know, in other words, yeah, it can be used as a communication device, like mm. a quantum squawker. So, um, yeah, it would, it would be a problem. So you don't have that problem with Dirac. That's the thing is that you, it, 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 uh, and it'd be interesting to work all this out once we were versed in Dirac to work all this out to see how much the corrections are. You know, they're probably and, and not I really I appreciate you bridging, like, you know, the calculation that we ended up doing, you know, getting to talk about a concrete hydrogen atom, getting to actually plug in different numbers, you know, into yeah. a linear equation, basically, or almost linear equation. And then relating that with this huge mathematical framework that you're um, working on. I think that's just a lovely connection. Um, that's yeah. and that's a very uh, promise. That's kind of like very encouraging about your research that you're able to. Well, this is maybe not related to your research directly, but at least it gives some handles. Oh, it is. Research. It is. I had to work out these. I had to work out these examples in order to, in order to test things on on my ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, these are seminal examples. Um, and like you know, we spent a lot of time kind of getting through them in a not very elegant fashion. Um, but you can see that you could consolidate all this. Like if it was a textbook, mm -hmm. it could be two or three pages of a textbook at most. You know, it's not it's not a lot. And um so the circle of ideas isn't 
you know, it's not super, you know, formidable, you know, in terms of learning it. So, okay. Um, okay. So Peace see you and in love. A, in, Thank you, John. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. I'm a Patreon supporter for Math for Wisdom because Andres and I have been friends for a long time, most of our lives. And the conversations I've had with him over the years have been very useful for me. Uh, he's also a big, big fan, my supporter, you know, of my work. And um, we just we have deep conversations about math and physics that have been useful for charting the course of my interests. And you know, I'm just I'm grateful, and you know, I I want to support that, and you know, our weekly or bi you know semi-weekly or bi-weekly conversations have been have been um, very important for me in the last couple of years, especially. So yeah, that's why I'm a supporter.